We're back, man. It feels really good. Dude, it feels really good to have you here. Comic fam, we just hit phase two. So the social circle out here in Snohomish County in Washington State where we film has just opened up. So we're back. We're doing content again. That's right. We're phase two. MCU is on phase four. We got to catch up. True. Uh, still be mindful, obviously. We're still being careful. But uh, really excited to really get back in a studio space where we can play off of each other. We can really get comfortable and bring you guys the content that we've been trying to bring for like the last couple months. Slap the like button, hit that subscribe button. We have a bunch of content planned for the community and we have a fun show today. We're chatting about tattoos. I'm gonna get into some of my tattoos. We've made over 500 videos. I've been asked to talk about my, my ink and I've never done it before. And we're gonna do it today. Yeah, I'll talk about the ink that I don't have. And uh, what else are we discussing? We're going to discuss some foreign books. We're going to discuss an after show that's going to talk about the history. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. We continue the show on our audio platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. We keep the audio going after the camera shut off. So you're going to want to find us on those platforms. And that's where you're going to hear some of the history of bags. Like, where do these bags that protect our comics, all right, that we love so much, where did that start? Where did that come from? We got a treat for the comic fam. You know that we have a headless variant done by the new hottest artist on the scene, Peach Momoko, available in the mystery mail call. You only got into the 15th to join the community and reserve your box. Every member is going to be getting a copy. Some lucky ones are going to get a virgin copy. And because we've been working with Peach, I was able to get a bunch of information. We have a top 10 list that is so special. You got to stay tuned. We're talking about the year of the Peach. Guys, make sure to take that moment to comment down below. Enter yourself to win this Alex Ross 9.8 Immortal Hulk number seven. This actually came from him. All right, you got the verified signature. It could be yours. Make sure to comment down below and let's get into some tattoos, man. Dude, there are some awesome characters that have some of the best tattoo designs. Some of them aren't great, but there's a handful of them that are just next level, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, in the, in the whole comic ethos, a lot of characters have tats. So I, I kind of want to discuss, and I think we should discuss uh, importance of these tats because it's more than just the, the look of them, right? It's also what do they stand for? Are they appropriate for the character's design and who they are? I mean, obviously you can go nuts. There's a lot of tats in the, in, in the comic realm. But what, like, what makes sense for that character? And what are our favorites? Like, Let's rank them the top 10, just best tattoos that fit the comic book characters. Let's start with number 10 here. All right, we're going to jump into uh, kind of Sword Brothers, if you will. All right, you have Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes, two very popular characters. You know, Snake Eyes first appeared in G.I. Joe number one. Then you have Storm Shadow appears in that sound issue, G.I. Joe 21. And that's where we get to see these matching tattoos these two have. They both came from the same dojo. They both blame each other for the death of their master. And we get to see this connection through them. And that's just become this kind of legendary uh, graphic for them that you see even people themselves tattooing themselves with it. This reveal in issue number 21 was major. You got to remind yourself, a silent issue isn't just about the action sequences. No, it's about telling the story through the panels. And when this was revealed that they had the same matching tattoos, it was groundbreaking. It was significant. I mean, obviously it's quiet, but a picture's worth a thousand words. They say that all the time. And this absolutely solidifies that thought. They have the same tattoo. They wear the same symbols, but they live such different lives, completely different lifestyles. I found a quote of what the tattoo means. The top trigram means water and the bottom trigram means radiance, also meaning fire. So in quote, water over fire, which indicates the need of perseverance and caution. And when you digest that, that's heavy. Okay, and it goes on. It says the superior man ponders danger and takes precaution against it. So when you kind of decipher that and you put that into the types of lives they lead, you can see how that can be appropriate. Absolutely. Just like this next tattoo, very appropriate for this character. Number nine on the list, we have Bullseye, the classic daredevil villain. This guy went all in. You know it's serious when you get a tattoo on the forehead. Yeah, anytime you get a face tat, you know you mean it. And uh, I got to tell you, like, this is on the nose as it gets. You have a target on your forehead, all right, for bullseye. And this is not the original bullseye, okay, but this is another bullseye. And uh, let me tell you, I mean, a guy who's supposed to hit the mark every time has a bullseye, I mean, come on, that makes just sense. It fits, man, and it's serious. And he's such a cool villain, dude. I love that idea. He always hits the target. 
Yeah, and I'm trying to think, like, if I had to ever get a tattoo on my face, what it would be, let alone on my body right now, I'm just thinking maybe I'd have, like, maybe it's too much, but maybe I'd have, like, Superman and Action Comics crushing a car on my forehead here. Just go all in Just for the first in. superhero? Yeah, absolutely, right? Comic fam, if you had to get a comic book tattoo on the face, what would it be? Let us know in the comment section below. Bullseye went full bullseye on his face. This next one, oh my goodness, it's underrated, man. I think that this is like, it's become a cult classic because people like making fun of it. But here's the thing, when you read this, yeah, okay, the art may be a little mad to you. You may think no one would actually get this like portrait on your chest. But here's the thing. It has some really deep meaning that makes me love a couple of these comic books from the Uncanny X-Men run. And we're talking about Colossus. Yeah, I mean, we know this romance that uh, or emotional f- connection that Colossus has with Kitty Pride. okay? And so it's almost this kind of timeless love, the, the way he, he paints it and it's portrayed. So when she did pass away and he wanted to get her uh, immortalized on his body, and in the past, he's had trouble with that because tattoos, pens would break because he would automatically, armor would automatically, how would you, how would you say, um, react to the danger. So he could never do it. This time he was actually able to slow his thinking process down as much as possible and got this a massive tattoo on his chest, which isn't revealed right away. Okay, right. we don't see that. We see him getting a tattoo in one issue. Yeah, 504. Yeah, correct, because 504, we see the process. He's got his tattoo, yay for him. And then 507, a few issues later, we get to finally see this, this reveal. Okay, this, this uh, uh, how would you call it? Um, well, he calls it unimaginable loss. Oh, he called it unimaginable loss, huh? Yeah. And it probably was, because when you look at this thing, it's like, um, God, what's the word I'm looking for here, fam? <laughs> It's like this uh, temple of love on his chest. You know what yeah, I mean? He's got shrine. himself. It's a shrine it's of a himself. It's a love shrine. It's got pictures. Like, can you imagine like, having a portrait of yourself in the metal form that you could go into with your loved one on your chest? Like, he didn't care. He's like, I need to be reminded every time I look in the mirror, memento style. Yeah, when I, yeah, just when he's just a regular man and he can look at himself and be like, these are the moments I shared. Next on this list at number seven, we have another cult classic character Beyond the movie that he was first featured in, we're talking about Darth Maul. He's in comic books, and his like canon was written outside of his one appearance in a movie. I don't really count the appearance that was in the Han Solo film. And he's got these tattoos. Everyone knows them. But did you know that he got them when he was a child? Yeah, the history on this has changed a few times. But, you know, guys, like, is there any other character when you look at and you're like, absolutely in love with the visual of this character and it's all tattooed and you're like this guy just looks like he can kick everybody's ass imagine like just stumbling upon him in an alley or something like that would be like one of the scariest per like fighters to have to engage with yeah just looks intimidating right i mean if the tattoos are enough the horns might throw you over the top <laughs> next one my personal favorite and number six on the list comic fam you're already gonna be like tom He shouldn't be on here, but we got to put him on here. Dr. Manhattan's got to make this list, even though it's technically a symbol that isn't tattooed on his forehead. This would be considered body modification, scarification. He did it to himself. A god can't be hurt. I get it. All right. You can see the searing in this image. It's not really a tattoo, but I don't know. It's good enough for me. He deserves to be on this list. I mean, listen, he's supposed to be like this American great hero, and he was given this costume with some generic atomic symbol, and he was just like, no, I'm going to simplify this to really the ground of what it is. And he draws this hydrogen atom on his head. Yeah, seemingly something that he respects, right? Absolutely. I mean, like, for him, that stands for something. This is actually featured in Watchmen issue number four, page number 14, a classic book, Alan Moore Goodness. Number five here is Gentle. It's kind of not the strongest of powerful names, really. But this character is really interesting to me. He's not gentle, that's for sure. No, his name is Nezhno Abedemi. He's half Russian, half Wakandan. And you know you have this immense power when you have to use vibranium ink to keep it in check. He has a mutant gene, and he gets super big. His body morphs so much to that it can morph too much. And he goes to the Xavier School for Mutants to not just learn how to be a... uh, proactive mutant in his community but also how to tame his powers and yeah he has to tame him with a tattoo so the image we're looking at here is his 
body completely covered in this glowing ink. Okay, they have these lines all across him. And it's almost kind of like a webbing or a net to really encase his abilities and full power so he doesn't injure himself or kill himself somehow just using his genetic ability of, of just his mutant powers. Yeah, the X gene knows no bounds. You know, some of these heroes, some of these characters, it's limited to just, oh, you got to wear some sunglasses to protect you, you know, Scott Summer style. But others, they could actually commit accidental suicide because they're so powerful. And if you want to catch his first appearance, because you're really enjoying this character, check him out in New X-Men number 23. But number four on this is really a fan favorite. And we're talking about Psylocke. Yeah, whose character development changed after her creation. She would actually go on to acquire new powers. And in the process, she would end up with a scar. So the psychic sister of Captain Britain here, all right, she's got this red thunderbolt over her left eye now. And that was only because she was practically murdered by Sabretooth. And to save her life, Doctor Strange and a few other people had to get this magic serum. And by doing so, brought her back to life Okay, and then that changed her character completely and her personality. So she shifted from one person to kind of a different mental state on top of that, the physical change of the of the red lightning bolt. Now she's got also a mental change. Absolutely. She is now a new character. And this happened in Uncanny X-Men issue number 333. Now we're taking it way back with number three here. Dude, man. we're going platinum right now. Yeah, we're going black and white cartoons. We're going, yeah, we're going back to like the 30s, if not earlier. But still comic strips, man. This is going to be the first tattooed comic book hero. True. From 1929 here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he loves his vegetables. And we're talking about Popeye the Sailor Man. Dude, I loved Popeye growing up. Yeah, I mean, how do you not like Popeye? I mean, he's always in some situation. He eats his veggies, gets his strength, beats up the bad guy, saves his girl. You know, he's got some cool friends, and he's got anchor tats on his forearms. Dude, I mean, this is a cartoon showcasing tattoos at a time where that wasn't really the norm. Yeah, I can't imagine there was anything normal back then to really be uh, pushing, you know, the exposure of tattoos to the younger generation. But, man, did I love these cartoons, dude. I really did. When you get that animated like tank in his bicep, you know, or or his chest is like a big, you know, sailboat or, or some kind of steamboat and he's just like his pipes all blowing smoke, he's ready to go. Dude, it makes me want to eat spinach, man. For I, real. I, I'm sure it did. I can't imagine how many more kids were actually asking about spinach after that. I wonder if the spinach companies had some type of ties to the creation of this character. It would be brilliant if it was. It would. It would make me it would make sense, right? Free marketing. Come on now. Okay, well, let's chat about a tattooed character in DC Comics, all right? Like one of the very first to be an antagonist. And we're talking about the tattooed man. This gentleman would have ink that was yellow. And you know the color yellow is very dangerous. It takes down one of our most powerful heroes, the Green Lantern. Come on, guys. What other list are you going to find back-to-back -back sailors with tattoos? That's right. Slap that like button, comment fam. That's what you have us here for. <laughs> yeah, Gotta bring the heat. That's right. It was like, you know, you had go-go gadget arms. You had like go-go gadget tattoos, you know. Let me get an airplane or a dragon or whatever else you can put on your body. That's right. And yeah, the chemical that he would like utilize, it would just take the Green Lantern down. Except when the Green Lantern was able to foil his plans by distracting him by his other tattoos. Listen, man. All right, if you're going to have a bunch of tattoos and you're going to use those as weapons, you better multitask more than one tattoo, okay, man? If you can't handle more than one or two tattoos at a time, it's going to confuse you, especially if you're fighting a superhero, then you need to just not fight superheroes. All right, number one on the list. I wish I had my dad here to help us out with this one, but you know we had to put this character here, and if you didn't know, you're welcome. We just gave you a recommendation of a read by Warren Ellis that you got to read. And we're talking about Transmetropolitan, and we're talking about Spider Jerusalem. I mean, a lot of people are familiar with this character to his design, at least. They know the glasses, at the very least. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into a little bit of it. So this is a futuristic character, all right? He's based off of a famous uh, journalist named uh, Hunter S. Thompson. Okay, look him up if you need to. And, um, you know, he's just a lot of satire in this, in this comic. You know, it makes fun of, like the the current situation of social status and just politics and then social media in general communication he's a journalist and a very powerful one in this dystopian future where they don't be like people don't care if you're like walking around naked and he doesn't care either and you can see all of these dope tattoos all over his body 
And it's just, it's memorable. It's something that makes you want to read the book, but it's also one that every comic book collector knows. I mean, there were so many tattoos on this guy, all right, that the artist actually had to have an action figure with him and the tattoos drawn him so he can remember where they were at all times. Can you imagine that? Like you just lose track because there's so much ink and you're worrying about panel by panel. Like, oh shoot, I got to remember the little diamond over the nipple, you know? Right, and this guy's bare, like pretty often, you know, bare armed, bare bare legs, or just bare naked. So right. you have to know where all of it is at all times. Absolutely. Comic fam, do you have any comic book styled tattoos? We want to hear about them. Tag us on Instagram. You can follow me at ComicTom101. I would love to see them. Tag me too. I'm at Golden Age Guru on IG. I don't have any tattoos. Throw me some ideas. I'd love to hear them, what you guys think I should be having. Yeah, I want to see what we can get the guru tattooed it up with. I don't think he's going to do it. I got some superhero tattoos. I've also had some mistakes on my tattoos. I'm going to get into that at the end of the show, so stay tuned. Let's get into one of the hottest comic artists on scene right now, debuting in 2019, but coming out strong in 2020. It's the year of the peach. I called it months ago. We got Peach Momoko. Yeah, if we're going to be talking about fruit, people are literally going bananas for her, okay? Like, for a year that has been so uh, tumultuous, really, or just such an odd year of 2020. No comics for three months. Yeah, I mean, to still see the interest level uh, in Peach is fantastic. And, and many artists in general, I mean, comics have been really strong, thank God. I mean, it's been difficult for stores, but the comic market itself and the interest level is still there. And we're seeing that in some some really, really strong numbers for her books. So we had the privilege of teaming up with Peach to make a headless number one variant courtesy of Scout Comics that everyone's getting in their mystery mail call this month. Got until the 15th to sign up and join the community and support the show. Throughout this process, I got to work with Peach. I got to chat with her. I got to ask her questions, see her process. So of course, with this new friendship, I like to call her my friend. I was able to get some insight on the process, the creative process. So this list is special because we're not just going over the hottest selling comics in the market. Because right now, they're literally, I had to redo this list multiple times because there's so many spikes happening. Nah, this list is about showing you stuff that no one's ever seen. We have preliminary drawings you're going to see on screen today. And we have commentary from the artist. Let's get into it. Yeah, let's dive a little deeper. We're not going to just see what you've seen printed, but let's kind of go through the process that she has on some of these more memorable pieces that you guys are all familiar with. Number 10 on the list is the clock issue number one. This is a store exclusive done by Peach, and it's seeing highs at $130 at 9.8. And this is a really cool example of something that you, you got to assume happens when artists are hit with so many jobs. They can't know every single comic that they're going into. And Peach was very upfront about this. She said that she was given the freedom to do what she does best, create something that was in her horror style. And that's what she did. She didn't have background on this comic. It's a very dark comic, but you know what? I think she killed it. It's a cool cover. Like you mentioned, you kind of have this dichotomy of madness on one side with clock parts, and then you have the other side of just, uh, just a regular person. So it's, like you mentioned, uh, a creepy dark story because the world comes or succumbs to hundreds of millions of people coming down with a very aggressive cancer. And it's this, this global conspiracy and one doctor's daughter's coming down with symptoms. So he's racing against the clock to find this cure, see what's going on. And that's what the story's about. On one side, you have just this gorgeous color work, watercolors. And then on the other, you have tragedy. You have something that looks demonic. You have something that is like a cancer. It's dark, but that's what she wanted. This is her horror style, and she's acknowledging that. It's classic Peach, especially when you start seeing all these other images. You're like, you know what? That, that is her style. That is her look. That's right. And number nine on the list, we have Peach telling us one of her favorite characters, which is why she was so excited to take on Strange Academy issue number one. Yeah, the character here is Magic. And if you go back to Magic, she's been around a long time. She actually first appeared in Giant Size X-Men 1. Okay, and granted her characters changed some to really become this character we know now. But it's a cool, strong image. She's got the sword, and it's a fun character for her. So she really dove in, and I love hearing how artists get to explore characters that they also enjoy instead of just being this, this uh, job for them. Peach said that the focus 
that she wanted to bring to this cover was the beauty, the strength, and magic's dark side. And I think she accomplished it. I'm feeling it, Peach. Just like I'm feeling number eight on this list. Red Mother number one. 9.8's hitting $175. Yeah, this has kind of got a similar feel of two halves like the clock. But same thing with her. She didn't have a lot of information to go on. Kind of went back to her darker roots just to give a creepier feel because this story here is, is pretty creepy. I want to see more horror independent titles request Peach variants and let her go wild. Let her do what she's going to do. This is an artist that if you give her little direction, she's going to just run with it. I always wonder about people who are strong leaning towards horror and their like uh, favorite list for things to watch and draw. I just wonder at what age that tends to kick in. For me, it was pretty young. Yeah, I wonder what she watched, you know, like growing up. What stuff kind of stuck with her to give her this almost Ben T style horror vibe to her art. She mentioned to me that when she was young, if her mother was ever trying to get her to be like a little bit quieter, maybe she was getting a little bit rowdy, a little loud. All she had to do was be provided a crayon. That's it? A crayon? I, 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 I haven't tried that with my kids, but I don't think it would work. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, man. Well, that's all Peach needed, man. She needed a crayon, and that is very telling. Something that's colorful. She was doing color work at a very young age. She could have said paintbrush. She could have said pen, pencil, some type of ink. No. Colorful work. And I think that shows in her art. That's a cool little tidbit, man. I got to tell you. You know, I like hearing the evolution of an artist. And uh, I also want to talk about this next issue Number seven on this list. Top, Star man. Wars, man. It's a gorgeous book, man. Yoda. We all love Yoda. We love baby Yoda. We like old Yoda. The pressure of drawing Yoda. Can yeah. you imagine? Oh, my God. To have to live up to a standard of yoda ness for the community. Let <laughs> me read you this quote, comic fan, because I th- my first thought was the pressure, right? Like new on the scene, drawing a major character like this. And this is what she said. I was very careful not to destroy everyone's image of Yoda. Calm, peaceful, and a strong master, a leader. It was a lot of good pressure, but I also wanted the cover to have the Peach vibe. I love that. If you haven't realized yet, obviously Peach likes to use watercolors, okay? And then the finer details with other utensils, okay? And so in this uh, image, and, and a lot of what her work, you find out that she has a lot of her emotion and expression coming in through the eyes of the character that's really really important to her okay so like you know you hear the windows to the the solar through the eyes and i know when i look at this i kind of get a lot of what she's saying i mean i do feel like it's it, it like circles and radiates the entire image around his face into his eyes and when i look at it i see yoda and i can just see him and you know those action movies okay with action movies where the hero is down and he's up against the villains and he's just like i'm when i get out of this I'm going to kill you, and then you, and then you next. And that's what Yoda looks like he's doing. He's like, man, I'm going to take out this guy, and then that guy, and the three dudes behind you right now. And that's just like the confidence look, the, uh, the calm, and uh, it's just a great image. She said that she focused on drawing his eyes to express not only strength, but generosity. He's kind, man. I, I see the kind. I do. I really do, but man, I'm more like... Yoda's going to kick some butt right now. That's what I, I'm looking at. I was like, man, I see what you're doing, Peach, but I'm going to look at it as like, he's going to kick it like five dudes on the other end of this page right here. 9.8's hitting $200. This book's kind of been all over the place. And I want to remind everybody, these books are hot. They're at the top of the market, but this isn't a spec list, all right? This is just what's happening and what we're reporting on. I'm personally looking for a lot of these books. I'm not buying them right now. I'm going to be holding off until I can see the prices after a little bit, after things have cooled down on these books, because they are low print, but I want them all. Clearly, there's a trend of people enjoying your work and being strong sales. So, I mean, for me, I'd be just trying to jump in onto the next wave. You know, having to digest these prices is tough right now. You know, I'll, I'll, if I see something like while diving through boxes, great, more power to me. But there's so many comics to like out there and put your money towards. It's hard for me to do that um, at this price point. Definitely one of those situations where you want to be kind of looking at the comics as they come out to get them early. If you're looking to try to score something at 9.8, that may have some value long term. Boom. Next at number six, man, is a one in 10 variant. Read only memories. Number two. Okay. This is selling for 250 at 9.8. 
yeah, respectable. And I think it's because of the color work. Yeah, I mean, we're going to say that a lot with her because that's just really her style, man. It's, it's, it's pretty evident. You know, it's nice when you can recognize an artist just by looking at the cover. And I think that's kind of what makes it more prolific and pushes the marketplace is when something is, is easy to separate from the masses. And that's easy with her work. She describes this as sci-fi pop, but she didn't want to leave it there. Yeah, this was an interesting cover. It felt very anime style with the color work and uh, the kind of perspective on it. It felt very like Speed Racer, DBZ, Akira. It's got this... Uh, this uh, Moto Compo bike on the front. The bike. Let's riff on that for a second. This Moto Compo is actually what it's called. It's a Honda scooter, the smallest scooter they ever released. And this thing is kind of like legendary in the motorbike community. There's actually trade shows of people who bring their Moto Compos out, customized and stuff. They're super small. They kind of transform her up so you can fold them and put them in the trunk of what would have been your Honda. She disclosed to us how she enjoys drawing motor vehicles. So for her, it's got to been a little bit of, or it has to been a little bit of fun to draw something so so niche. You know what I'm saying? So when I'm looking at this image here, we're getting to see for the first time a prelim of hers of this uh, particular image. And when you look at it, you can kind of tell how she started, where she finished. She looks like she almost began with the bike and put the figure on top. She finished the eyes because the eyes are so important to her that we get to. She really ca- tries to capture that emotion in her prelim, and we can tell just from this that. It's so close to the final. Right. I find that fascinating. And the fact that she went out of her way to mention that she just really likes drawing mechanics, bikes, transportation types of stuff. I want to see more covers like that. I want to see stores who are going to get variants made possibly incorporate some type of, I don't know, weaponry, mechanics, Mad Max style vehicles. I don't I don't know, but I like the direction that could go. Yeah, something, uh, it would be interesting to see that more mixed because I don't feel like I've seen any of that from her work. You know, I'm not talking like Kirby Fourth World, like crazy machines, but it'd be interesting to see her spin on, on, uh, on mechanics. This is a one in 10 variant. It's low print and it's spiking because of the cover. Yeah, this is another title. Look, a lot of us aren't going to be familiar with these and for her to have to not work from much either because there's no backstory, we get to see early interpretations of these characters. So just Gathering from what she had, she wanted to draw all the female cast for this comic of Vamps vs. Wolves, number four. That's right. This book is hitting $300 at 9.8 and climbing. And this was a Kickstarter. And she actually knew the creator, which is kind of fun. I wondered, you know, some of these independent titles, you know, I'm sure she was, you know, people reached out to her. But others, yeah, she has friends in the game and she's doing them a solid. And she had the opportunity to pick any one of the characters and she couldn't pick. So she picked them all and she did it in this pinup style. It definitely feels very pinup like. And um, I can definitely appreciate that because you just don't get to see it that often because it's kind of almost, it's not like a modern pinup. It feels kind of more classic style. And, uh, you know, for me, um, I appreciate that. Next on the list at number four, we have a major moment for the Peach Momoko resume. You know that's on there. We have Marvel Rising issue number one, the one in 25 variant hitting $325 at 9.8. Her first Marvel cover, her first comic book variant. Can you imagine the pressure? I can only imagine, okay, coming up to the big leagues and you're just like, this is your first at bat. She says she had to leave an impression on the publisher. Like she had to go into this with like guns ready. She had to bring the heat. And to step up and show them what you're worth by drawing more than one character. She could have drawn one character, two characters. Nah. Yeah. She could have just been, you know, I'll do my job. I'll get it done. I'll I'll just, I'll just keep it easy and simple. Okay. Just, just the norm. No, I'm going to do what? Six, seven characters on here. I'm going to show them my range. Okay. And spit it out and for it to. To hit like this in the marketplace, that's pretty amazing. We've been talking about the corneas a bunch in this conversation. We've been talking about those optics. And here, you see it all come to a point. She specifically said she had to bring the energy through the portraits. And it's all coming from the eyes. It was all here. And that's why you have multiple portraits here all communicating such energy, such vibrance, the peach vibe. There are going to be no shortage of peachisms here, okay? We're on a peach crush right now. All right, and we're going to number three, and we're gonna. There's some heat coming here, guys. All right, these are these are titles you're really gonna recognize. We got Silver Surfer Black. You guys all remember Silver Surfer Black, right? I mean, that was a major, major hit. This is issue number four, one in twenty-five variant. We are seeing nine, eight sales of this book for three hundred and seventy-five 
dollars. This cover is classic. You have Null going up against the surfer with a broadsword in his hand, defending himself. And this book started out different. We actually found out that the preliminaries of this had a completely different weapon in Silver Surfer's hand. Hot diggity dog. This is why you subscribe to Comic Tom 101. We are going to get a glimpse of what this could have been for the cover. We are seeing another version. And honestly, it's pretty damn cool as well. You know, I love the, the kind of Silver Surfer board. I think that was a wiser decision. But when you look at this image, I mean, check out this prelim. He's got a rapier, okay, instead of the board concept. So we're talking like, like Griffiths from Berserk. Shout out to Gem Mint, by the way, Berserk. And we're going with now a broader sword to match another broad sword. But look how cool this is, man. Look at this. Yeah, look at Silver Surfer's stance. It's so different. It's more of an attack mode than in defense. And this is really cool because when you're working with Marvel, you're going back and forth. Like, you got to get it right. These are very major characters, and it's going to be done by the creative team specifications. So she did change it. And we have more preliminaries to look at. I know Peach was excited about Null. I mean, you got this demonic character, okay? And so to get the, the freedom now to draw something that you love like that, you, she, she put it all out there. And he looks dark. He looks uh, threatening. He looks massive and intimidating. And she did a great job. And if we look at these images, we could see her process. You know, you have the, the beginning stages of her watercolor. And then she comes into finer details with mixed media, where we're like talking like ink, colored pencils, and anything that's really going to layer on top properly. Yeah, take a look at Silver Surfer Black's arm. That's color pencil. That's what makes it look different. Like I was kind of re-looking at this cover to see how, yeah, there's paint in like the red of Null in the sword. But also you have this like almost combination of colors that are coming out of Silver Surfer. And yeah, it was done by colored pencil. Let me read you this quote by Peach. I saw Null as a demonic and beautiful character, and I wanted to really bring out his evil beauty. See, that, that's, that's the deep thinking about an artist. You know what I mean? Most people be like, I'm going to draw this dude with long white hair, make him look massive and, you know, dark. Yeah, she really likes Trad Moore's artwork. I mean, we've mentioned this before. Trad Moore is the favorite artist of the creatives that we like. And going into this title, you know that she had to make him proud. I do not know Trad Moore personally. But gosh darn it, if you were not proud of that, you better be proud of that. Gosh darn it. <laughs> Tell them about number two, man. Number two, Ghost Spider number two, the one in 25. That's right. Shout out Sean and Maguire. Yes, this is selling for around $700 at 9.8. This was actually one of the first books that I covered that Peach did on the show. And when it landed, it landed quick. The prices were moving up so quick, so fast. And it's because of a combination of two things. You have Ghost Spider looking so good right on the cover, taking a selfie. And that has become a classic Peach Momoko shot. We're seeing other renditions, homages, if you would, of her own work that she's doing herself because people are requesting it. And look at the background. She went nuts with the color work. And I think that's really what draws people in and makes them want to buy this comic. I don't know how you can't really like this image, to be honest. I mean, the, the colors behind are absolutely amazing. Uh, the whole uh, familiarity of what she's doing and relatability is great. She and says she wanted to portray Gwen's street side. Does it get more street than taking a selfie? No, it, it doesn't. And it's just a beautiful rendition of uh, Spider Gwen. And if we take a look here, we get to see kind of how far she goes on with her first, just to get the concept and the idea. And I, th I think that's captured here very, very clearly. In this first draft. Yeah, in comparison to the final. That's right. And then she will move into a much sharper version of pencils and maybe even some inks before she overlays it with her color work yeah and then boom we have the final that comes out so vibrant with that spider silhouette that mignola negative looking so good yeah i will put this for me is probably one of my favorite pieces for her and not just because of the number selling but just for the visual aspect of it, uh, it's one I'm really, really digging right now. Probably, it might even be my favorite out of this entire list. Yeah, I, I, it's a, it's tied for me with number one, which is a classic book. It's a key book. All right, we have TMNT issue number one hundred. This is the death of Splinter, and seldomly do you see a key moment 
not be listed in titles when it gets sold because this book isn't selling because it's the death of Splinter or if it, or it being a TMNT milestone. No, it's selling because it's a classic Peach Momoko cover now. This is a cool rendition and form of expression she used for this cover for the Turtles. And the instant I saw that, the first thing that jumped in my mind is Seven Samurai, Akira Kurosawa. If you are not familiar with this film, you need to watch it. Black and white, foreign film, absolutely amazing. This image emulates very much what uh, samurai posters look like. And that is what inspired this cover. This issue has seen some crazy gains in as little as a week. When I initially made this list earlier in the last week, this book was hitting around $200. We're seeing sales around the $450 mark now. And I don't know what to say about that price. It's definitely deterring me from getting this book right now. I'm kicking myself for not picking it up a while ago, but the story behind this book is amazing. So you see, Peach actually teamed up with another illustrator, Tommy Lee Edwards, to make a promotional poster at the North Carolina Comic Con. And this poster had TMNT on it, okay? And this idea came out of this collaboration to have Peach do a variant cover in the style of like vintage samurai films. Yes, yeah, she absolutely killed it with this cover. That's exactly what I'm seeing and, and it's exactly how I would envision it to be portrayed and to have that added pressure because Kevin Eastman was at this convention as well. Yeah, so, the, like the day that this was debuting. Yeah, so you kind of have that historical pressures of the creator of these characters that you're portraying and you're going to have to like face them and yeah. hope that they're proud of what you did with their characters. We actually have shots of different versions of the turtles that you're seeing on screen that didn't make the final cut. She was taking this very seriously. She wanted to get this right. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're seeing with peach right now. She puts a lot of thought behind the uh, being true to the character, being true to herself as well, and really um, trying to play both sides and honor it equally. And I feel like when you put that extra thought into it and you have those pressures that you really are doing it justice to whoever you're uh, portraying in your artwork. Yeah, she's got to give that peach vibe, that signature that she has become known for and gives reason why the community is so pumped about her entering this comic book market. People are going bananas for peaches. Damn right they are. Comic fam, let me know about your favorite peach Momoko variant in the comment section below. I want to know which one it is. And let's chat about your comments. This comment from Thomas Max is going back way back. because It's been a while since we've done a podcast. And this is in reference towards um, Ian Levine, who has a complete DC run. Okay, And it's up for sale. At Sotheby's. Can you just like reiterate a complete DC run? Complete. Do you mean like from the New 52, we've got a really nice Batman, Zack Snyder run? I believe it's from 1935 or 36 to 2014. Yeah, so including that Zack Snyder run and that Action Comics one. Right. So it's being sold all as one, uh, basically one item. That's right. And we reported on this. And we had more individuals comment on the way he stored his comic books, which was flat in stacks, than the actual collection itself. Exactly. A $10 million collection. Let's just completely bypass that <laughs> and look at how people are storing it. So this is what Thomas Mack wrote. I store my expensive comics by boarding most of them on front and back and by stacking them on top of one another. That's only about 20% of the collection, though, and the rest of the books are in varying lengths of stand-up boxes. Interesting. So he's doing not just a double board from the back. He's doing front and back. He doesn't even want to see what comics he's dealing with. Yeah, it's kind of, I don't know how comfortable I am applying a board to the front of my cover. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but if all things work out like they should, there's no type of rubbing effects of any kind you're kind of pressing your books at the same time because that weight will compress. So in time, yeah, you're theoretically making your books nicer. Yeah, I don't know about putting a board on the front of my comic book. I don't know if I'd go that far. However, I do like to put more than one board in my bag for the comics and the PC. There's something to be said about putting like three boards in that bag. This looks nicer, man. 
it feels nicer. It looks nicer when that bag isn't floppy and wrinkly, but it's really like tight and the weight, it just feels good. So it adds up really quick boards, but if you can do it, man, put three boards in your, in your uh, bag with your comic. Yeah. Life changing. We want to know how you store your comic books, fam. Anything interesting? Are you going to maybe like surprise us? We want to hear about it. We may talk about it on the show. This next comment is from our conversation about food in comic books, specifically about us making some like meals based off of ingredients and tutorials that are found in comic books, like Green Arrow's chili, a famous chili that you can find the recipe for and make. This is what Dave Newburn had to say. I want to see it. Would like to see Ryan and Russ involved in the eatery as well. Dang you, Dave. You are right. And I know we got a lot of requests for this, and we will do it. Now that we're in phase two, which is like at least being in a similar space, we're going to make this chili. Yeah. We're going to make it right. We're going to eat it. We, we got to document it. Two Gun Pedro says, cooking with Comic Tom, I think you may be onto something. Comic fam, let me know what you think. Do you want to see us make you some superhero themed meals? Of course, per comic book direction. Comment down below. Let us know. DA Hobbyist says, really enjoy when the Golden Age has the floor. Does the Golden Age Guru have his own podcast? I had to put this in there. Comic fam. I've been telling the guru he's got to hit the mic more talking about gold. Would you want to hear him spit gold? What do you think, Jeff? Could we get the community to motivate you to maybe hit the mic and share some golden age stuff outside of this table? Yeah, I mean, oh, man, why well, you got to put me on the spot here, dude. I swear. Uh, so I started to make some content for my channel, just uh, golden age guru, and um, hasn't gone very far. Kind of got. Uh, I need. To, I need to get to the mic, guys. You guys are right. I do need to make some Golden Age content. I do do a show on Tuesday on Golden Age books on Comic Core every week on Tuesday, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and it's all Golden Age heavy. But yeah, you guys, I, I gotta do my own thing sometime, man. But it's so hard because I love coming here talking as uh, and talking to somebody and just being part of a team. But uh, da hobbyist. You're calling me out, man. I need to do it. Comic fam, I'm going to put the Golden Age Guru's YouTube link in the description below. Go show him some love and maybe he'll hit the mic. Now, I got a treat for you, okay? We caused a ruckus a couple weeks ago. I say the word ruckus a lot. I like the word. It fits right because, you know, we reported on something that happened. All right? The historical record, right? I even said it in the video when I reported on it because I knew people would be going crazy because there was a Marvel preview that features Miles Morales on it on the cover for the first time ever, and it graded at 9.8 sold for $2,000, all right? So we reported on it, and people had their things to say about it. But you know what? We were able to verify the purchase, which is why we brought it to the mic. We found out the seller and the customer, and we were able to validate that this transaction happened and that it happened for good reason. The person wanted it, which is the best reason to collect. So that wasn't enough, because we brought that to the mic, and people had... To, to bring up their opinions, right? I went a step further and did the community a solid. I got the customer on the mic. Let's ask him some questions. Comic fam, we got a treat for you. On the line with Craig Mitchell. And this is the first time we've had a member of the comic fam, like not YouTube associated, not like member of the show associated. No, member of the community on the mic. Let's give a big like and round of applause for Craig Mitchell. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thanks, Tom. I'm, I'm actually really, really glad to be here. So it's cool to be on your show. So, ah, but right. uh, well, let's uh, chat about why you're here, Craig, because the first thing I want to chat about is, well, let's first get this invoice on the screen. This is a rare occurrence. I talk about sales every single week. And there was a sale that happened recently that was staggering, that made its rounds on the internet that I even mentioned on the show. I knowing that it would be causing a ruckus in the community. And we have a rare occurrence of the buyer reaching out to the show to chat about the reasoning. You know, we're talking about a previews. We're talking about the first preview appearance. Some may call it a true first. Some call it a real first appearance of Miles Morales. I got to know $2,000 sale of a 9.8 catalog. Why this book? Why this character? Well, all I can say is it's, it's Spider-Man. So, I mean, uh, I'm a large Spidey fan, so I have been since I was a kid. And uh, I, I honestly, I think people maybe kind of overlooked 
this book, been looking for it for a while. And uh, it, it came out, it, it's interesting. I actually uh, ended up buying one of the lower grade books probably three days, four days before. And then this guy came up and it was like, oh, geez, what do I do? And I, for two days, I, I sat there and I watched it. And finally I, I decided, okay, I'm just gonna reach out to the seller and uh, uh, throw a bit out. And this is after I did a lot of, I call it research comparables that have sold and, uh, you know, threw out a bid and we were uh, about a thousand dollars apart to start. But uh, after, I don't know, one or two days, we, we finally agreed on a price. So why this book? Uh, I, it, it, it's a gorgeous book. You know, as far as other, other previews that are out there, it's, uh, you know, say one that's not on the cover is a whole cover, uh, you know, and it just jumps out, grabs you black. It's, it's scarce. There's only, well, at the time there was only two on the, on the census. And, uh, I, I'm one of those guys that look for, I don't know, things that are a little bit different, I guess, a little bit more scarce. And it's something, uh, it's something that I've been wanting for, for a while. So I love hearing that I, uh, you were hunting it, it, for it, this for quite some time. I have a question for you. So I, sure. it makes sense why you would buy the book. You're a fan of Spidey. It sounds like you invest in other types of rare appearances that may be outside of Canon, you know, catalogs and such. I want to ask you about that. But maybe before we get to that, why did you feel the need to reach out to me? You know, you're a buyer. This is a private sale. No one knows who you are but you felt it important to reach out. And I, I find that fascinating. Yeah. So, so what happened is uh, uh, I ended up seeing a lot of the uh, column webcasts that are out there. Uh, and I, I just started reading through the comments about how this was a conspiracy. We worked together to pump up the price, whatever. And uh, I, I just felt like, okay, I'll, I'll talk to you and say, Hey, uh, if, if you want, we can uh, do whatever we need to do to dispel some of the conspiracies out there outside of wearing a tinfoil hat, because I'm not going to do that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I just I I don't know. I it is funny. I was uh, uh, fat, dumb and happy after buying the book. Uh, and then some of the chatter was out there and I just started looking and I, I couldn't believe what a ruckus this sale caused. I mean, I was, I was excited. You uh, uh, even talked about it on your show. That was, that, that was, uh, I don't know, special for me, I guess. So, and uh, yeah, it was on key collector, I guess the fact that it was a record sale. So I made a screenshot of that, but uh, you know, outside of that, I, yeah, I, I had nothing to, I, I don't know why the, the conspiracies were that I was working with others. I didn't even know the seller. So some of the theories out there uh, were that uh, the seller, I worked with the seller to pump up the price. So, uh, you know, a box of these can be sold, you know, and make people a bunch of money. I don't know. So well, I, I, again, I appreciate you calling I, in. I just wanted the book. You just wanted the book. So, I appreciate you clearing that up. Um, it's funny. I mentioned during the list, I said, let the comments come in. I'm trying to remember this verbatim. I said, let the comments come in, but I'll remind the community that this is the historical record. I had reported on the sale. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the key collector <laughs> update of the record happened post the sale. So I want to make sure the community understands how we put these types of things together, because although we may talk about comic books on the show that may cause excitement, that will influence the market because we are bringing attention to the market. When a catalog spikes like this, we want to make sure that we are reporting on it accurately because this is an outlier. This is abnormal. And there's just not a whole lot of collectors like us in the community because I'm someone who has spent money on previews and catalogs and the such. But I thought, Hey, we have someone who is in the community yeah. who's collecting like this, who wants to clear this up. I appreciate it. Now tell me what other things you collect, because I'm assuming if you're putting money into a 9.8 catalog, that's super scarce. You may have some other things that may be impressive. Yeah. Well, I, again, I'm, I'm, 
I uh, look at things that are maybe a little bit more scarce. I, I like 30 days a night, the spiral edition. I got that sheesh, years and years ago off of eBay. So, and uh, you know, oh, that's love a it. great uh, example right I, there because I, that's on my grail list. You know, that's actually, that's like a huge grail. That's a preview that was sent out to comic book stores, not a comic book. But there was a recent sale on the CGC forums of $1,500. Not to mention the recent sale of this very catalog that we're talking about, the Miles Morales preview, of $2,500 this very week. Yeah, and it's funny, the, the sale that you're referring to on CGC, the buyer actually knew I had that and, and wanted to buy it off of me. And I told him no, but uh, probably a year and a half later, I saw someone selling it. So I reached out to him and said, Hey dude, there's one for sale on CGC and he's, he's the guy that ended up buying it. Oh my it. gosh. And, you You're know, killing he, me, uh, man. Dude, I said, welcome, welcome to the club. That's how this goes. You know, there's the uh, Salt Lake City Comic Con pamphlet that the first prototype Hellboy. It's like when these things pop up, the collectors who are hunting it typically have crossed paths before because we're all looking for it. Craig, I appreciate you joining me on the mic today. Thank you so much for clearing this up, for sharing a little bit. I got to ask one last question. What's your favorite modern book in your PC right now? So I, I got a lot of uh, Spider Gwens that I, I absolutely love. So, uh, but I, I would have to say the Ultimate Fallout variant. So outside of my my Marvel previews, ninety five. Oh, he says that it's a Miles Morales appearance. That's his favorite. It makes sense, comic fam. Hit the like for me. Let Craig know that you appreciate him joining us. Have a great one, Craig. Thanks for joining us. We're gonna have to do it again sometime. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, uh, geek responsibly. That's all I have to say. So appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> appreciate you, brother. Keep up the hunt. So happy to have you back here, man, because one of the reasons why I was so excited and just waiting anxiously and just longing to have my homies back in studio is because a part of this podcast is talking about the collectibles, right? Showing you the collectibles. I take pride in trying to blow the community's freaking minds about comic books. And one of my methods of doing it should be no surprise than to do it with my guest here to blow your mind. So I've had these foreign comics sitting here and I refuse to just experience it through webcam. So we're talking about some foreign comic gems today. And I'm so excited to show the community and to show you, Jeff. We are gonna talk about something in the foreign comic book community that has gone virtually unnoticed, all right? beyond the foreign comics market. First question to you, Jeff, in us starting this foreign comics conversation, what changes in the community have you begun to see? I've definitely seen a kind of a, a surge of interest in it and for myself as well. I'm just having the understanding that there's so many versions um, out there other than the ones that are familiar to us uh, at, our, at our homes like in the U.S. and that the fact that there's, there's so much better potentially than what we we're known to see for us, that just like what we're familiar with. So that's what's great when you get out of this perimeter that you know into global. You're seeing variations, and they're better and they're more exciting because they feel new to something that you love. Absolutely, the foreign comic market has the ability to rejuvenate the most tired of collectors. There are some really, really like known dealers in this community that just don't look at comics the same way. It's just something that happens. Like, you know it to be true. I know it to be true. I mean, heck, there are some comic books that are looked at as like the pinnacle of key worthiness that even myself, I don't look at the same way as I did a decade ago. But the foreign comic market, I have seen it time and again, rejuvenate interest. And today, I want to showcase something that doesn't get talked about in the foreign comic market. We're going to take you over to Denmark, okay? I got some comic books shipped from my homie over in, De in Denmark. Shout out to Martin, who hooked it up, all right? In order to get foreign comics, you got to have the foreign network, and that's part of the fun. You, you create friendships, new relationships, collectors that are global. And today we're going to talk about double keys. So you're telling me there's something better than single key? That there's actually double key? That's right. And I'm going to start this off by showing you a book that you're going to know very well and a cover that looks very different. Oh, yeah. So talk to me about that. 
Okay, give me a second, because this is the first time I'm seeing this, all right? Yeah, comic fam, I specifically avoid showing any of the guests these types of comics. I want to get an authentic reaction. Okay, so we have here is Amazing Spider-Man 298. Yeah, you know this cover. Yeah, first uh, McFarlane Spider-Man here. So it's different. You know, you have the, if I remember, it's just a white background. Okay, Correct. and same with 299. Very white, but 301, same thing. So here we're kind of just seeing a very, uh, you know, early morning, you know, sunset, sunrise. Can't really tell what time, but just the orange. And, uh, you know, I, this this is a tough one. The, the, the webbing is purple, which is instead of, I think, is probably just black. And so that's kind of cool. And I'm just, I, th I think I like the U.S. version better. I agree. The reason why I wanted to get this book was one, yeah, it's a different cover. It's a little different, but what I want to do is show you the inside of this book and why this right here was just a, a authentic moment that I had by myself with this comic book. I thought I was getting Spider-Man 298. That's all I knew. Comic fam, you can't find pictures of this comic book online. Heck, you can't find pictures of Hombre Arania online. And that's like one of the most famous foreign comic books that exists. So what I did was I was flipping through it. And I'm like, man, this thing's kind of thick. And I went to the last page. And what's on the last page here? Oh, man. I know this page. This is the last page to 299, man. This is his first appearance. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> We're not starting that. We're not starting that, guys. That's right. You have on the back page, I opened this comic up to find the last page of Spidey 299. Confused. I went backwards to find out that this isn't just one comic book. No, this is combined issues 299 and 298. Both stories are in this book and both keys are inside, but it gets better. Go to the very, very last page of this book. All right, you're building it up here, man. Let me see this payoff. Oh, snap. No way. We have what? an American version of Spidey 299 inserted on the last page as if it was an actual Spidey 299 cover. It makes no sense. And how would you know this without going on the hunt? Mind blown right now, dude. That's so trippy. And it's like the same coloring for the most part. Yeah, they didn't have to change it. They, they printed it. They printed the right cover right in the book, but they decided to change it. Double keys. Now, this next book, you're not going to need to take it out of the bag. And I'll tell you why in a second. I have two books to show you. They're the same book. But let's take a look at the front. You know it well. Oh, man, I know this book well. And like, Liz, let, me, let me tell you this, man. You can't give me a book like this and not have me not take it, want to take it out of the bag. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm, I'm trying to build the excitement, Jeff. I'll let you open it. No worries. All right, so I'm going to open this. Open it. I'll let you Okay, open. this is World by Night number one, all right? And obviously not the version I'm familiar with, but I know this cover, man. It's a cool book, man. It's a classic key. But wow. here's the thing about this book. When you open it, it actually looks very similar to the pages you would find in America. I mean, this is the exact replica of the book. Uh, it's just black and white. Interiors, there's no color. Um, you know, I know this story. I've read this story. This, this is it right here in its entirety. This is a major Bronze Age key. This is something that like, I'm personally after myself. But here's the thing. We're talking about double keys today. And you have to imagine, you have to put yourself in the position of the publisher back when these were coming out, because these came out not long after the American versions. They didn't have a care about what comics they were going to include in here. They were trying to print stories and sell them. Maybe if the cover was dope, if they can sell the cover, market it a little bit better, that was the care. But they didn't know what comics they were going to put together if there was like a key worthiness. So by happenstance, in Denmark, this comic book was combined with another. Flip it over. Oh, no way. That's right. Shut the front door. So, you know, I had to get two of them because I want to display them next to each other. But what are you looking at? Dude, this is Marvel Spotlight 5, man. First appearance of Ghost Rider. That's so weird because you got Werewolf by Night 1 here. It's not even Marvel Spotlight 2. Yeah, so Werewolf by Night first appeared in Marvel Spotlight 2. Issues before Marvel Spotlight 5 where Ghost Rider was featured. 
But nah, they put Ghost Rider on the back in his first appearance and then the first solo issue, A Werewolf by Night on the front. That's crazy. This is a double key. That's right. Comic fam, there are more double keys in the foreign comic market and they are as like random as this one. Like these are actually featured in like some of the similar titles, you know, like it's all within the, the genre, but it gets even stranger because they did it differently in Greece. They did it differently in Brazil. They did it differently in Spain. And I'm excited to get a chance to acquire and to find out what hidden gems are inside. This is why you open your books. Okay, this is a clear example. This is how you find your Mark Jewelers insert. This is how you find your double cover. This is how you find out that John Romita signed your Spidey book. Okay, Chris Claremont, or you know, signed your X Men book. This is how you do. You open it up. All right, and you find these out when you're grading your book because you really should open and grade your books. You know, especially when you're buying something. So check them out. So obviously, with foreign comics, outside of just that random publishing situations or signatures. You just don't know what's going to be in the back or in, on inside, and you've got to open them all up. And who knows what you're going to find? I mean, that's the exciting part is the search and, and then the wonder and like, oh, my God, look what I just discovered. It's a fun thing, man. It's definitely given me a ton of excitement to grow my PC and also to learn about the historical record of these titles. You know, I want to know the history behind how these came out, the publishing secrets, and the situations within the countries while they were being produced. Like there were major changes in politics in a lot of these governments. There were changes to the economy that affected print counts, what was being published, how they were being published. It's all fascinating. So slap those likes, punch that subscribe button, karate chop whatever you want to karate chop. Comment down below, guys. Let me know. If you had to travel to any country in the world to get a comic book of your choice, which country are you going to go to first? That's right. It could be a write-off. All right. We are going to chat about a topic that I've been asked to hit the mic about for quite a long time, but I'm not going to get into it yet. I want to kind of want to milk this one long term because I got a lot of tattoos. My tattoos have stories. You know, I have certain characters tattooed on my body for some reasons or another. I know people can see my Plastic Man tattoo. It's my most commonly commented tattoo that when I go out and I'm on dealer floors, you have a plastic man tattoo. It's a thing. But I want to chat with you about tattoo mistakes. I'm going to start out with that because I think that would be a really fun story to tell because I have a lot of different comic book themed tattoos. But I've also had laser work done. I've had tattoos removed so they could be redone because of how poorly they were done initially. First off, you mentioned you don't have any tattoos. Is there a reason why you don't have any tattoos? Not really. It's just, I don't know, it's just not my thing, man. Would the missus like them if you if you like surprised her with like wings on your back? I don't think so. I, don't, I, I mean, she'd probably be indifferent, but I don't really think it's something that she cares for either. But it's just um, for me. I don't know. I just it's just not for me. And God bless anybody who does. I don't really care either way. Just for me. Just for some reason, I don't know. I, maybe it'll change sometime down the road. I'll be like, you know what? Yeah, maybe I ready to get something. But for now, man, it's just, uh, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like something um, that excites me to get or do. Yeah. I grew up with a dad that was hitting the tattoo parlor pretty regularly. So I remember sitting in the, you know, in the front of the store waiting for my dad to finish up his Star Trek tattoo, you know, which he has a Klingon tattoo. And it's, it was a thing. Like when I turned 18, I'm going to go and get a tattoo with my dad. It's like, it's something he talked about since I was little. He's like, we're going to get a tattoo when you're 18 like since I was like seven years old. So I did. And the first tattoo I got, and it has nothing to do with superheroes. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I thought it would be cool to get like a, a fallen angel. That was kind of the idea. Angel of death. I don't know. I thought it would look cool, right? I was looking for something trendy. I was young. I just turned 18. And again, it was more about, I'm going out with my dad. I'm going to get a tattoo with my dad. So it's less about what it was and more about just getting it done and having the experience. He was getting some stuff done. It was exciting. The thing was, the tattoo artist that I was partnered with to do the tattoo, he just, he wanted it to be bigger, all right? He, I wanted this tattoo to be like this big, all right? What he, is that, like three inches by three inches or something? Yeah, I wanted like something small on the inside of my arm, you know, something that was kind of like, yeah, like a small tattoo, because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. But in that moment, he convinced me, no, like, you're going to end up wanting to get more. Why don't we just go big? Let's do your whole arm. So I got this tattoo on the right side of my arm, and... 
what you'll see right now, I'll put a picture of it up so you can kind of see it close. This right here is not what I got. <laughs> This right here has not just been lasered, it has been redone like three times because what this tattoo artist convinced me to do was some of the most terrible art on my body and it was immediately embarrassing. I trusted him and what he ended up providing wasn't an angel of death. It was like an anime looking angel that was in just short shorts, nothing else, in a fetal position on an onk. And you know, at first it, it seemed cool when he drew it on my skin because he was kind of doing it freehand. But at the end of it, you know, end of the day, when you're looking at a, like just the anatomy not being right, and I'll, I'll show pictures of it, it was rough and it was something that I had to live with. I'm like, oh, this is not something I'm proud of. So I immediately started getting work done to try to cover it up. And there's this moment that if you get a tattoo fixed or if you have a an error that happens in your tattoo, which I'll get into here in a second, because this isn't the error. This is this, the first tattoo that I got that was problematic. It requires typically multiple tattoo artists to provide their opinion. So I'm sitting in this chair with three, four artists standing around me thinking, huh, how can we fix this? And legit, they were floating the idea of just giving me a bird tattoo. Can we make this a crow? Can we make this maybe like a, a, a parakeet or something, you know, uh, something that sings, something that talks, something that's avian, you know, why not? Birds are dinosaurs. That could be cool. And I said, no, 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 no. I really, I really don't want a bird tattoo. So instead, I, uh, the tattoo artist did some magic and threw a cloak to cover up the mistakes. And now I have this skull looking angel of death on my arm now. That, um... That's crazy, man. I, I got to tell you, man, like hearing that type of horror stories, I can't even imagine like getting something permanent on your arm to have to become like undo it and make it unpermanent. And um, it messes with your psyche, man. There's months where I'm just like, ah, oh, I, I got to fix my body. It's uh, no good. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine, man. I remember in high school, God, my friend who's like a mediocre artist, but like. Also, like that guy was just really irresponsible and he got like a bought a tattoo kit or something. This was like in the 90s. All right. And yeah, when uh, your friend gets a tattoo gun and he gets excited or she gets excited about tattooing for the first time, don't volunteer. No, you don't want to be that person. No, you don't. You absolutely don't. And thank God I had the wits of me to not want to. And uh, I'm sure I know I got pressured and I know other people got it. And I was like, every time I saw their tattoos, I was grateful. <laughs> I didn't make that decision to jump in, and uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm sorry you had to go through that, man. That's nuts. Well, that's not the only mistake we're going to talk about today, because you know that was just I screwed up. It was my first tattoo, and I just I trusted somebody too much who was too new at the trade, and they did what they thought was right. All right, no harm, no foul. It was my fault. The other mistakes, however. No, nah, nah, nah. that wasn't my fault. That was a tattoo artist's fault. They had to be lasered. They had to be redone by a completely different artist. And this artist doesn't even work anymore in the tattoo industry. So the first thing that I had to, that was a, that was a big problem, okay? Like for real, dude, like I've been doing the show for two years, but I've been in the comic book community for a very long time. And I got to be straight, hitting the dealer floor with a tattoo that you're not proud of, of a superhero comic book that everybody knows yeah, it's an embarrassing thing. It's something that I don't wish upon my biggest enemy. And this tattoo artist did a rendition of The Dark Knight Returns because I do have The Dark Knight, Frank Miller style, and Robin tattooed on my arm. The head of Batman that he made was so wrong that it didn't look like Batman. He angled the head at an angle that made him look like he was injured in the neck and the eyes were too small and the cowl was so small that it looked like he was maybe a wrestler or something because the cowl was more of a circle and it was the worst like I thought this one was embarrassing but when I went home and I was staring at this tattoo I remember texting Russ a picture of it and he said something along the lines of yeah it's really hard to draw Frank Miller and that's Definitely not what you want to hear friends say. <laughs> I kind of laugh away from the mic because I'm going to blow a bitch on it. 
I'm sorry, dude. It's it's funny, but it's not funny. It's funny because it happened to you, not me. <laughs> dude, I was like having panic attacks. I was looking at like my phone at the picture of the comic, and I'm trying to fool myself, putting them next to each other. They're pretty close, right? Right, Tom? Like I'm trying to like like convince myself. You're talking to mirror, Tom. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> man. It was rough. So here's the thing. I, I had to get it fixed. There was no way I could live it down. I wore long sleeves for months. I paid hundreds of dollars to go and get the head of Batman, of Bruce Wayne, the Dark Knight, Frank Miller style, removed. I had a hole of a fading Dark Knight head on my arm for months because every three months, I would go in and get laser work and then go, all right, tattoo artist, can you draw it yet? And he goes, no, nah, just go and do another round. We need it a little bit more faded, a little bit more faded. I went into the like laser removal and I messed with them. They have a consultation with you. They want to set you up for success. They want you to know what you're about to get into because it's not an easy process. And they're like, all right, so you have a tattoo you want to remove? And I'm like, oh, I do. I want to get rid of my whole sleeve. And they're like, uh, I'm like, I'm just kidding. I just want to get rid of the head the Batman head. And they're like, what's wrong with the head? I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> it needs to be gone. We need to get rid of it entirely. Please get rid of this luchador, okay? I need the Dark Knight Frank Miller style. It's the truth, man. It's what I needed. It's what I wanted. It's what I got. And, I, you know, I wish I could say it was the only mistake, but there was one more mistake on my arm. And it was the same tattoo. Like, how, how much of a bummer is it that it was the same tattoo? But, this moment that I described at the beginning of this conversation where I was experiencing multiple artists look at my arm like it was some type of puzzle that they had to figure out. You know, like you go to the bank or something and you have this like very simple looking puzzle and you have to like take it apart and put it back together. That's the look that I had on multiple people. Like you should have just provided them these little trinkets to figure out. Like they're looking at my, my arm like it's a crossword that they've never, in a different language. Like, how do we fix this? Well, I experienced this again after Robin was completed. And an artist walks up and looks in my arm and says the worst thing you want to hear. Why is the R backwards? Is it supposed to be? Just like that. Verbatim. And that sinking feeling, you feel it in your ass, man. I'm being real with you. I look down at my arm and the artist revert. He reverted the image because it's on my left arm. I don't want Batman going that way. I want him going this way. But when you revert the image, the letters are, are switched around. And the R was backwards. Terrible. That's, that, that's, uh, that R is for ridiculous, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but for real, dude, here's the thing. They figured it out immediately. Like it was done, and then they looked at it. So what would proceed to happen is the artist would go over the R every single time I went in for ink with the correct coloring to reverse the R. And if you think about how an R looks, you can imagine, oh, okay, there's ways you can hide the fact that it was done incorrectly. And if you add the negative space over and over and over again, you can get rid of the, the black that was done wrong, which Fortunately, today, I do have a finished Dark Knight Returns with the correct looking head, Frank Miller style, and an R that is accurate. Let me, let me see this thing, dude. So now you know. Take a look at it. Wait, why is the tricep there? <laughs> <laughs> screw you dude comic fam we love you we're glad to be back we're going to continue this conversation for a little bit in the audio only portion find us on spotify itunes stitcher or soundcloud thank you so much don't forget to like comment on this video i'll enter you to win this immortal hulk issue number seven signed and graded by the cgc by alex freaking ross Man, it is so good to be back. I got to tell you, thank you guys for joining us on our first podcast back in a long time. I'm going to show you guys a couple giveaways. Not even giveaways, winners. Okay, so make sure to comment down below so you can be winners next time. This is going to Zachary Walsh, this Torpedo Deceased One variant. Funko Fix Doggy, you get a Saga trade paperback. 
That's right. That's from the PC. You can email us at bagsandboardsgiveaway at gmail.com and we'll get those out to you. We also have a third winner, Very Gary Comics. He's a homie in the community. I don't pick the winners. It's all random through the random comment picker. But he's going to be getting the variant logo signed by Eris Quinones. This is something that was provided to me when I first met Eris back when we started the show. And I kept it for the first time that he came on the show on the podcast because I wanted to do a giveaway because I figured there would be one day maybe that he would join us on the mic when we were big enough. And we accomplished it. Gary, I'll probably have to sing you something else too because you're a homie in the community. We appreciate you. And as always, geek responsibly. Enough said. <laughs>